There we go. Hey everyone. Um, I know it has been some time since we have done a notional pipe stream. And uh, basically that's because we were really busy with all kinds of stuff. Um, but uh, we are now back. We are now doing uh, you know, more streams. Uh, we're hopefully going to not have a big long hiatus this time. Um, probably as a result, in order to make sure it's manageable, they'll be a little less long than they were back when we were doing them before. Because some of them sort of stretched out past two hours and it was starting to get a little difficult to deal with that. But, um, but you know, we can still do plenty of streaming. It's a little shorter than that. Um, anyway, uh, before we get into today's topic, which is going to be about componentized rigging, um, I wanted to announce that, actually a couple of things about uh, Little Bird. The short that, um, you know, if you have followed what we've been doing at all, was something that uh, uh, Chris Perry and I worked on um, along with Jill Daniels and, you know, a bunch of other people too. Um, but primarily the three of us were, were sort of the primary uh, people focused on the short and it was directed by Chris. And uh, not only is it just nominated for an Emmy, which is really not something I expected. Um, but apparently, uh, they really are, I mean, it would make sense nominating, uh, web video these days, not just television. Um, and yeah, then, that's really cool. Yeah. That's, uh, that's awesome. Congratulations. I, yep. And, uh, then the other, the other thing is it's actually available publicly, which it had, it had not been for a while, actually. I think, I think probably for, you know, film festival rules and stuff like they don't like it when you. Uh, they, they kind of don't want you to uh, just have something available on the web while you're submitting it to festivals. But uh, now it is, in fact, available, um, not just on Fortnite, which is where you could see it before, but on Vimeo, where you can go to um, Little Bird. And I will just, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing a blog post about this shortly. I was actually going to do it this morning, but then some things, you know, took me away from that a bit. But I will post the link uh, here as well uh, in the chat. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's something we spent you know a really a, a you know quite a lot of time and effort uh, working on and that we're really proud of and uh, used contour for you know and uh, for all of her deformation used the ephemeral system for all of her animation. Um, Indeed, we did quite a lot of work on the ephemeral system, sort of in the lead up mm -hmm. to it, just to to add features you needed for it. Exactly. As I and, uh, right, I mean, there was a whole bunch of cases where it was like the state the ephemeral system was in at that time, this pro this project was one of the things that sort of pushed us to, uh, you know, push it a little further into where we could use it for a big production. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say a big production, right? A big production is like a feature film. A, a small production, but one where, uh, you know, we had to do like a bunch of shots, right? Um, and, uh you know, in addition to that, the, and here's another thing, actually, I can announce, the Little Bird plugin, which we've also talked a bit about uh, on the channel, um, the real-time rendering and compositing system that uh, I designed for Unreal, uh, is now also available on GitHub. Uh, it has, it is currently not documented. Uh, we are still working on documentation, so it's going to be a little difficult to use. However, if you would like to download it and play with it, and even modify it if you like, I mean, it is open source and you're certainly free to do so, uh, I will give you the GitHub link for that. I actually should have prepared for that beforehand because I kind of forgot to, but um, this is what it is. Um, now, how to use it is probably going to be a bit unclear until we actually do get some better documentation in place. Uh, we did have a stream about that, actually, a few months ago, uh, and that's probably a decent start, but it doesn't really tell you everything you'd need to know to be able to make use of it. Uh, however, um, you know, assuming you don't mind poking around with some software that isn't, isn't you know, very clearly documented, it's totally usable. Um, assuming that you uh, can handle the um, constraints on... Uh, you know, complex, you know, complexity of geometry and scene because it certainly has some based on how it works. Uh, there is nothing stopping you from going and using it and using it in a production if you would like to, right? Um, so, you know, hopefully this is something that's going to be useful to people, especially because there's really no equivalent for it in the pipeline, the 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 context of how Unreal is usually used these days. Right. I shouldn't say usually use these days and what, it, what it's designed for. Right. The ability to do real time multiple passes and comp them in real time uh, is the sort of thing that real time rendering is incredibly well suited to, but which game engines usually aren't designed to do, which is 
understandable, they're designed to be game engines. Um, right. And I believe that this is the first product of its kind that pushes Unreal in that direction. Uh, you can certainly get other tools that will do things like allow Unreal to export stuff to Nuke, but that is quite a complex thing to do in many respects, in part because Nuke itself, you know, it's a funny thing. Um, people talk about how in in a conventional rendering pipeline, uh, you know, actually getting your stuff, you know, your, your full 3D rendering is sort of your bottleneck. And in your, in a game engine centric pipeline, uh, uh, Nuke is often your bottleneck. The compositing could be your bottleneck because it isn't really designed to be real time in the same way. So this is an attempt, a first attempt to get over that hurdle. Well, and that has a lot of advantages too, right? Oh, I yes. mean, like if you're putting it out to Nuke, you're not seeing you know, one of the real great things about using something mm -hmm. like Unreal is you're essentially seeing the render as you're animating. Which Indeed is pretty you useful, are. Right? And there and is so a plugin that attempts to sort of bridge that gap, but it's mm -hmm. still much less real time than this approach. You know, it, it, may, it makes a huge difference in terms of how fast you can do things. Uh, but yeah. that's not really what we're here to talk about. Um, uh, I just wanted okay. to announce those things because, hey, they happened today and now and we're streaming and I should talk about them. But uh, what I would most like to talk about is uh, what we are actually talking about for this stream, which is componentized rigging. So yeah. I'd better give, I think, a little bit of a preamble about what that's about, because I certainly expect that while the concept is, is likely to be familiar to some of our viewers, uh, it's probably not familiar to all of them. Um, right. So, and I, I think we should also give a little bit of context first up about what it means for contour. Mm -hmm. um, componentized rigging is not dependent on contour. You can do no. componentized rigging. You know, it's just, it's a technique sure. for rigging. But one of the things that, that we've noted is there are a fair number of people who are interested in contour, but who also would like something that's a little bit more like an auto rigger. Mm -hmm. And as we've discussed before, especially RAF, sometimes at quite a bit of length, you know, we're not necessarily all that crazy about traditional auto riggers, despite the fact that we've released a few of them, at least as Anzib in studio. Yep. But um, what I think the componentized rigging is going to allow us to do is to put out something that serves the same purpose as an auto rigger without really actually being one, but that allows you to essentially uh, apply body plans with contour rigs so that you basically get a completely working contour rig um, that you can basically just resize and, uh, and apply to a mesh. Yep. And basically, the, uh, the 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 intent here is that you'd get something that's not unlike, you know, like TSM, right? The setup machine. It's you you know you have your you have your your widget that your body plan that you place inside your character, and you bind your character to it, and you can paint weights from there. It'll be much easier than it used to be because it's contour. You don't have to paint all that many weights, but is as a similar level of ease. So what I'm showing here is generally a a uh a tutorial in a sense of how you would build a componentized rigging system but also the 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 basis of something we intend to actually put in contour and ship with contour um so you're actually sort of watching me to a certain extent uh actually sort of build a feature that will end up going into contour but at the same time it's not a central feature to contour in the sense that it is something that any anyone could build their own componentized system that utilizes contour um, and in fact, we would highly encourage any studios who want to do that themselves to do so. What we're going to be building is very much intended to be um, something where you just sort of, you know, it's intended to be for the ex exactly the sort of customer who might have used the setup machine, who needs the ability to put a flexible, effective rig inside their character pretty quickly and without a lot of, um, without necessarily having to understand an enormous amount about how the rig works internally. Uh, but if you do understand that, uh, you are free to, and in fact, we would highly encourage people to use these concepts to build their own systems around Contour. Um, so essentially, for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, like what is componentized rigging, I'm going to sort of like do a little bit of a preamble here. Um, uh, one second. I haven't streamed in a while. And um, I forget how, how dry your mouth gets when you're just talking constantly. So in a traditional auto rigging system, what you are doing is writing a script that builds your rig. And the simplest version of that is, you know, make this node, make this connection or constraint or what have you, make this other node, make this connection or constraint or what have you, and you just, you know, that's all you have. And you just continue with that until your rig is built. 
And uh, to probably no one's great surprise, this often doesn't work out very well because it becomes almost impossible to edit very, very quickly. And it's, in a sense, what you are building when you are building an auto rig system is really you are writing a tool that, well, you are writing a script that in a sense compiles to a rig. Because, and again, this has been a point that we have made, you know, many times during these streams, and I like to harp on this a lot, rigs are in fact programs. Rigs are software, right? You are building a, a program when you build a rig. So you're building a program to build a program. And this is the sort of thing that uh, actually people do all the time in programming, right? I mean, you know, you'd have a situation in which, um, as, as a random example, one of the things we do with the ephemeral system is we use a tool called Nuitka, which takes some of our Python code and compiles it to C, which then compiles, you know, gets compiled to an actual, you know, executable. Um, however, when people are, when programmers are doing, are doing uh, that kind of, you know, situation, they're usually doing it because what they are creating, like the top level representation is simpler than what they actually intend to create in the end, right? Writing something in Python is generally going to be simpler from a code point of view than writing it in C, right? You know, that's why Python exists, basically. And, uh, you know, it has other disadvantages, um, but that is that is generally, like, why you want a high-level programming language. And the problem we usually get with auto-rig tools is that it usually ends up being very difficult to actually express what you want through whatever the, the description that your auto rig system is going to take and turn into a rig. Because as I was saying before, most auto rig systems that actually work well are not like, you know, procedural in the sense of, you know, do this, do this, do this, then do this. They're not giving you just a, a list of commands to execute to build your rig. They have some sort of structure to them. They have modules of some sort. They have a concept of some sort of higher level description of the rig that's going to get turned into a rig. But my experience with auto rig tools is that it they almost always calcify, right? That's what they're intended to be. But in the heat of production, you encounter some situation in which you need to make a modification to a rig that doesn't fit into whatever paradigm the auto rig system is built around. And frequently what ends up happening is people just have to open the rig and just do something to it, manually mess around with it in some way. And this often means that the rig becomes unrebuildable, right? The auto rig system, a good auto rig system is intended to be able to build and rebuild a rig because you may need to make changes to it. In fact, you're almost guaranteed to do so. But any modification you make to in, in, in the scene usually kills your ability to do that, which, which really makes it and sometimes exceedingly inflexible when the paradigm that your auto rig system is built around may not accommodate whatever it is you discovered that you need to do. In addition to all of that, since I'm now just sort of ranting about auto rig systems, they tend to get like super complicated and frequently they are difficult for people even at the company who where, where they are often developed to use. And in my experience, I have seen many times, like possibly a double digit number of times, like over the years, where a company builds an auto rig system and then somebody maybe leaves the company or they, they go to a different part of the company or something like that. And the system ends up essentially getting abandoned because no one else actually understands how it works. Uh, it's a very common, it's, it's, it's a, a surprisingly common scenario. And, you know, that scenario could probably be avoided by like actually making people like actually document stuff, right? Um, but the, ultimately, I think there's a real issue with the concept of auto rigging as like, oh, we're going to write this big script that's going to generate a rig and it's going to have to be organized in some sort of very specific paradigm. And, and it's, it's sort of, it becomes inflexible almost by definition, especially when the rig itself in some cases is actually less complicated sometimes, or could be less complicated than the auto rig system that builds it. So componentized rigging is a way of getting the everything you you need out of an auto rig system I and mean, your your th things that you absolutely can't do without you need for instance the ability to uh re rebuild you know build multiple rigs along the same plan right i mean you obviously need that you you can't possibly do a production without that ability um 
But there is this alternative way of doing this that doesn't have all of these disadvantages. And that is essentially treating the rig graph itself as if it is, in a sense, kind of a programming language. Um, and specifically, and this is a very interesting thing, and here I'm going to get into some stuff that's like kind of a little bit technical, but I mean, actually, it may be, may be very technical from, depending on how you how you think about it, but which I'm not going to like look at it from the point of view of code or, or math. I'm going to, you know, be demonstrating what this means in my, uh, like, in a scene. So hopefully, even if you're an animator, and I'm about to say some stuff about functional programming, and you're going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about, that the ideas that I'm trying to get across will actually end up making some sort of sense. Um, because what we actually need in order to get a, a repeatable, the ability to make a repeatable rigs, where we can sort of stamp them out just like you want with an auto rig, but where they remain malleable is the ability to actually abstract aspects of the node graph itself, package them up into components that define what they do and that therefore make it easy to change them out or to modify something outside the, the boundary of the component without affecting what's inside it. We're essentially imposing the same kinds of constraints uh, I shouldn't have used the term constraints because that has a specific meaning in, in, in rigging, doesn't it? Um, we're imposing the same kinds of, I suppose one might say, self-imposed, self-chosen limitations that people do in, that programmers do all the time in order to be able to make their code comprehensible, right? In order to be, be able to make it uh, maintainable and understandable. And this is, uh, you know, this is sort of thing, Tagore understands much better than I do because I'm not you know, really a particularly experienced software developer, and he is. So I'm sure feel free to jump into Gore with like, you know, like useful programming <laughs> insights, assuming they're not like too esoteric because some of our audience may not get it, but you know. Yeah, I, I'm a little worried I might get a little too esoteric, but I think some of what you're talking about does have a direct analog. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. all that useful to talk very much about it in, um, and we talked about it a little bit before in, in code generation frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. There are there are some frameworks. I remember, like like actually, the the GUI system for Windows back in the day used to be uh, there was something called MFC, and it was like tremendously, tremendously complicated to set it up. Um, but within Visual Studio, there was this whole thing that would generate a lot of the code of your app for you, um, and that does that always winds up being problematic. And it turns out that when you need to do that kind of stuff, having something that kind of exists at runtime, much like if you have really powerful macros, for instance, like list macros or doing things with various types of framework, you know, that, that kind of work at runtime and are first class objects at that point, rather than just like generating a whole bunch of text code for you tends to work a lot better for that kind Indeed. of thing. And I think that there is a real analogy here to what we're talking about uh, with this kind of rigging, actually. Yep, absolutely. What you're talking about, so, so you know, this is terminology that probably some of our viewers will be unfamiliar with, right? Especially people who are more interested in, like, the ephemeral animation demo and stuff. But but when you're, get, when you're talking about things, about things being done at runtime, or um, that has a lot of an analogy to, to componentized rigging, in that the instead of generating a bunch of stuff that then just remains there as data, like it generates a rig in a Maya scene, um, which is what your typical, you know, auto rigger does, and then and that the scene could potentially diverge from what the, the auto rigger has created. Componentized rigging creates the relationships that make um you know stamping out like repeatable rigging possible at runtime largely meaning when the scene is loaded like ultimately that is actually kind of what it means because the way that these components work at least in this conception of it and there's multiple ways that you could do this is that each component is a reference so the relationships between those components are being defined by various connections between things in the maya scene not by some sort of like code framework that somebody has invented that is going to like generate a bunch of stuff into the scene um, and I realize what we're saying here is a little vague. And so I feel like I should jump in. It's abstract. Really... Yeah, it's I, abstract. I think, uh, you know, maybe like a minimal example, which it looks like. You right, right. I, and I actually I actually brought up this example because this is the first example that I made of, of one of the components that we would use in this system. Um, this is an arm. So one of the central aspects, and we have, we have two different things here. We have a component and we have guides. Um, and the guides are real time. So here's what's going on here, for instance. If I take these guides and I move them around, I am defining a rig, 
just as if you have like a widget or something that you or guides or like whatever you're going to call it that you then an auto rig system would build the rig out of but no rig is being built this would be the equivalent if you were actually going to you know treat it as if it were an auto rig system of the rig being rebuilt every time i move this thing it's fully real time and it's fully adjustable which is actually another really critical aspect of this no lengthy build process is necessary and what's actually happening here is that i have inside my component and i'll go into how that works and what that means a little bit in, in a minute um the the equivalent of a section of rigging that you might have an auto rigger build for instance like that's one thing that you might you might do with an auto rig system you do it like build this section of rigging but the auto rig system is going to set a bunch of data in various places as it goes about building this stuff it's going to be like oh it makes a joint and the and the and it makes a bone and the bone is of a specific length right or if it's conventional maya joints like it's at a specific like translate x value and then it just leaves it there right it made this thing in a particular place and, and that's where it is. And what that means is, is that the component, the, the all this chunk of rigging that you've built is not, um, if you need to change any of that stuff, you can't just go change it. Uh, theoretically, perhaps you could, but it gets increasingly complicated because the state of the system, like the, the things that differentiates this arm from other arms is spread all over the place in a million different places and so usually what happens is you end up anytime you want to change the arms proportions running the script again and rebuilding it and what this does instead is very analogous to a programming concept i mean it is actually i would say not even analogous but actually literally an example of this programming context uh functional programming um which is something that, that you know, Tagore has taught me a lot about and that we've used pretty extensively when developing the ephemeral system. Um, and what differentiates functional programming from a variety of other programming paradigms, of which there are many, is that functional programming doesn't allow you to sort of hold on to a bunch of information about whatever it is you're, you're attempting to create in a lot of in a lot of programming paradigms so hmm. i'm trying to figure out a way to explain this yeah, i'm not sure that's how i would characterize yeah. it but um I, i'm not sure that it's that profitable to go really deeply into the nature of functional programming sure. here either though i mean i think maybe we just want to look at like what are the advantages here in terms right. of this the kind advantages of here are these this component does not store any information about its proportions it has it receives that information. It receives the information that it needs in order to essentially decide how long all of these things are as these inputs. And the inputs are attributes. I've chosen to do it in this particular way, and it's not the only way that you could do it. And I should note, by the way, um, that I have not uh, I have not actually uh, mentioned this yet, which was which was a huge mistake because I really need to give him credit that uh, Raphael Fragapane. Uh, is the guy who at least popularized these concepts. Um, I don't know if he's the first person to have done things this way, but he certainly is uh, the person who popularized them, popularized these ideas through Cult of Rick. And the way that he did things is he was actually, he actually did things a little bit differently. And we can sort of get into what the differences are. I don't know that we need to get into them right now, like while we're sort of in the middle of this other explanation, but this isn't the only way that you could possibly do it. But what this does is all of these things are matrices and they define a whole bunch of relate of, of, of sort of input states. So like, like, where's the elbow? Where's, where's the hand? This is all various bits of information. The component itself doesn't know anything about where those things are. It depends wholly on the information it's getting from the inputs. And that's how it is analogous to um, functional pro the way functional programming works, but also that it is anal that it, it pro the, the benefit you get in this case, right, is that because there isn't data being set in a bunch of nodes all over the place, you can change the proportions of the arm simply by changing the inputs. And the only thing that's actually going on here in terms of how the guides actually control the component and change its proportions because here's here's the thing that we can see here like let's say i've got this arm and here's um oh it's it's in ik right now i'm going to turn off ik 
It's an FK, right? So this is a full, like, normal FK rig. I can change the proportions of this live simply by moving these locators around because they are being fed into the inputs. They cannot... Meaning that anything inside this component is completely interchangeable with any other component with the same inputs. So this allows you to, for instance, make a different version of the arm, and as we'll see when we assemble this, swap it out without affecting anything that, that it depends on or depends on it. Meaning that you can go and manually modify rigs that were built with a componentized rigging system like this, add stuff to them, as long as you don't change anything inside the component. And then, be, and then change out the component or modify the component in some way in a way that applies to multiple rigs without disturbing any aspect of that rig or requiring any kind of rebuild. It's in that respect, and it's not the only way in which I think that this method of doing things is superior to um, sort of conventional auto rigging, it gives you the ability to essentially not worry about what kinds of manual modifications you may need to make to your rig as long as the component itself operates the same way. You'll still be able to, in a sense, rebuild the rig at any time without disturbing manual edits. And that's a huge deal, because this is exactly the kind of situation that productions encounter constantly. You've got something ad hoc you've got to do to your rig. How are you going to do that in the context of your auto rig system so you don't lose your ability to rebuild the rig? There are answers to that question in the context of an auto rig system, but they're all complicated. None of them are simple answers. So before I sort of proceed uh, proceed further, I do, however, want to ask, we have just sort of thrown a whole bunch of theory and some fairly abstract concepts sort of onto you guys. Please let us know in the comments, uh, did any of that make sense, <laughs> right? You know, I didn't really prepare this with like a lesson plan or something, and we are going into some stuff that could be a little bit complicated. So, uh, you know, let us know if we've lost you and if and if there's aspects of this that you'd like a better explanation for before I go into the process of actually building a simple component, which is what I'm going to do next. I'm going to build a finger. It's the simplest, pretty much the simplest component you have. Well, we can go on. We'll, you sure. know, we'll watch the comments. Um, but we'll be watching the comments forward. and feel free to, uh, yeah. feel free to chime in and ask us what the hell we're talking about. So for a finger, for instance, here, let me, here's how I'm going to do it, actually. I'm going to create a new scene to create this finger in, and I'm actually going to reference in the arm, uh, essentially so I can refer to it. So, uh, Matthias, I hope I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, Matthias Royervik is, uh, is asking something here. He's asking, tentacles are often a massive pain for regular systems where you have so much freedom. The ability to build live the behavior you need would be amazing and something I want to play with. Yes, so tentacles are actually a really interesting case because uh, you actually would, if you want to build something like tentacles with a componentized system, which you use as multiple components, because you might want, per tentacle, because you might want an, an arbitrary number of controls. Like you don't know how many controls you want in your tentacle. And so the way you do that in a componentized way is you actually, you actually make, um, the because the components, I probably should have led with this. I kind of buried the lead in this whole a discussion the components act like kind of like legos you sort of snap them together and they've got like an interface to each other that you can use to you know to, to sort of sna to snap them together and to pass the data between the components in in a simple and easily defined way for something like a tentacle what you do is you make a number of those or you make you make one you, you use a number of those that sort of snap together stack on top of each other to make your tentacle meaning you can always add another um, so it is, it does become, and, uh, it, it becomes much easier in many ways. And I think that that idea can be taken even further in something like control rig, for instance, uh, in, in UE, where the controls themselves can be generated procedurally. And again, at runtime, so it doesn't have all the issues of conventional auto rig system, where you'd be able to essentially, uh, truly vary the number of controls in a repeatable way that doesn't disturb rigging sort of outside the interface of your component box as it were but anyway what i'm doing with the what i'm doing with the arm this arm is basically i just want to have it here for reference 
um, because, you know, it'll be useful to refer to to see, like, what are all the things the ARM component has, because uh, all of these all of these components need to have a similar interface to the rest of the rig. So let me just sort of, oh, I locked that. Let me, let me just move this stuff. Um, so it can get it out of the way. Probably this is going to double transform. Yeah, it is. It is going to double transform. Um, I'll just move the, the components and not the guides and hide the guides. I think that's what I'll do. Right. All right. So let's start by putting down the, some, uh, contour joints that we're going to build our finger rig around. We're going to start with a um, uh, a metacarpal because that is a really important thing for fingers to have. I'm not really trying to snap it very much. I'm just going to zero out the the controls in a minute. Let's see. Yeah, it's basically going to be like that. Um, I don't really care what the lengths of these things are because I'm going to be driving their lengths with the componentized uh, the from with the system itself soon enough. Um, I just drew them down to like you know get some get some bones in there. Um, I am going to turn off the radius because I don't really need to see it right now. Um, none of the lengths really matter, but I am going to... Well, it actually doesn't really matter because I'm about to drive next joint orient um, with this stuff. Because here's the way in which making componentized rigs with contour is really, really simple. Um, you can very easily change the length bit of a bone. You, if you if you know what the length is, you can change it very simply. Um, not generally true with other types of rigging where you just have a bunch of transforms and they don't encode any idea of what length means. So let's see. So we need for this system to work component. Let's just take a quick look in here. And inside our component, we're going to need inputs. We may eventually need the rest of this stuff. We'll get to that. But this is the important bit. And on the inputs, we are going to put a set of um, in uh, a set of, of matrices. And because we want this to be very, very simple, we want it to, the interface between the various components to be as simple as they can be, we're going to make these all world matrices. And as you can see here, you know, in the case of the arm, we needed a whole bunch. We'll need a few less for the finger. But let's see what we think we need. Yeah. I'm an outliner. All right. Uh, I'm going to have to do this bit programmatically because I am pretty sure that in Maya's GUI, you cannot actually... Um, I probably already have PyMel imported. So I do. Um, in Maya's GUI, there is no actual way to make matrix attributes. That's not a thing. So we are going to have to do this uh, by command line, but we're already deep into like some some rigging stuff here so i really think it should be okay uh let's see so we're going to take the selection and we're going to do add adder let's see if i remember the correct thing to do here we're going to call this um metacarpal uh and we are going to well should we call it metacarpal or should we call it like base or something like i'm mostly not using very very accurate terminology for anything here so i'm just going to call it base um, following on with our naming convention for the arm, which uses, uh, joints, right, as elbow rather than a sense of bone. That's not upper arm, right? It's, it's our lower arm, it's elbow. We're going to do a similar thing. The next one will be knuckle. Um, but, right, so the first thing we need to do is to, like, add adder base. Um, I think it is data type that needs to be matrix. No. Is it data type with a capital T? I'm about to have to look. Yes, it is. Yeah, here we go. Here's our here's our matrix attribute. So we've got base. Next one's going to be knuckle. No. Windows, what are you doing? Press the wrong key is what happened. One after that. Hmm. Should I do knuckle? No, I'm actually going to undo that because I don't know what to call the next one. I'm just going to do joint one, joint two, joint three. So, you know, I actually have a quick question here, Raph, and I don't sure. want to disturb what you're doing too much, but I myself am thinking about this. So when you're building like these components, because this is something I don't know a great deal about mm -hmm. this kind of rigging. 
Um, they're references, right? So you're referencing That's the file right. in, as a component. So components themselves can reference in components though, right? So they you can. can you can kind of snap these together. It's kind of recursive in that sense, right? Yep, that is an option. Although generally speaking, the way I've done it is I haven't really done that, but there's no reason why you can't. Like instead I've done things where it's like, well, you have a whole bunch of components snapping together in your in your rig scene, right? And you don't have them internally. But certainly for a lot, and partly that's because I'm using Contour. Because if I wasn't using Contour, a lot of Contours, the stuff that Contour does for free anyway, I'd probably want to make subcomponents to do that stuff, like proper twisting and stuff like that. So absolutely, subcomponents are an option here and probably a good idea in a lot of cases. All right, now let's make some locators. These are going to be our guides. Oh, it automatically did the right thing. Joint one, joint two, joint three. So I'm going to do this, this, these fingers. I'm sort of thinking about how I want to arrange them because there's multiple ways that we could, we could drive this information. The fact that we're doing it all with world space matrices means that we're really free to parent these in a structure if we want to. I think the thing that I'm going to do right now, and we may decide to change this and that's perfectly okay, is I'm going to make them a hierarchy because it makes, uh, it makes things a little easier in terms of pulling the right data off of them. Um, Oh wait, actually, uh, that's right. What it what it makes a little easier is keeping them aligned. Actually, it's not so much pulling the data off of them since they are in fact world space matrices, and it doesn't matter. Um, but keeping them aligned, one of the things you generally would want to do here is to keep the matrices aligned. Uh, and you could set up some constraints or something to do that in your guides. But I think it's a little simpler to do this and to say, uh, if for these guides, you can translate x. That's your length, uh, and you can rotate however you want. But you cannot. Um, choose to uh, to move it in any direction that you wanted to. If you wanted to be able to do that, that would be fine. If you wanted this to be totally freeform, that's what I've done for the arm. You would have to set up some constraints to, to keep them aimed at each other so that you, they'd always be aimed down the bone axis. Um, but this is, and we may do that for the finger, but for now, I'm just going to do this because it's simple. All right, so... We are going to pass their world matrices into our inputs here. And then we are going to get out of the inputs that data and use it to drive the underlying joints. Windows, what are you doing? Thank you. Let's see. Now, normally speaking, I actually have written myself a little bit of code to do this, to do so, to like automate some of this process. And they're, and they're simple little, they're not like a framework. It's a simple little set of functions. I'm going to do it manually here because I think it'll make it a lot clearer what's actually going on. Uh, but, you know, it'll take a little bit longer because it's, you know, doing stuff manually. Um, this part is is actually fine. It's, it's like some of the stuff we're going to need to do later with matrices. Because there we are going to be messing around with some matrices for sure. Right, so world matrix is all we need to do. Not world inverse matrix. That would give us very much the wrong answer. All right, so we are driving, we are now driving the inputs and now on the other side of it, we're going to take the data out of the this matrix data out and use it to drive the joints. And to do that, we're going to need to put it in the correct space. And we're going to do that with matrix nodes rather than trying to mess around with something in the hierarchy, which is actually quite clean in terms of how you manipulate that information. It makes it very clear what's going on. And so I really, really like stuff like that a lot of the time. So uh, let's see, what are we driving here? We are driving the bones, not the joints, because the joints are gonna become our controls because this is contour and you can do that. Ah, I did forget one that we need though. We also need the overshoot. That's right, we've got joints one, two, three, 
but then we need joint three overshoot. So actually, I had forgotten one that we need there. We also we have a, we already have that on the arms, as you can see. We have um, no, that's sorry, I selected the wrong thing. I should move my outliner over to the other side. Oh come on, doc, please. There we go. Let's take a look at our inputs. Arm inputs. No, sorry, I meant the attribute editor. Sorry, you you you'd think that I'd like been using Maya for like twenty years. Like you'd think I'd be better at this, but anyway, um, right. So like hand overshoot, for instance, is the area in which the hand goes past the joint, and because this is contour, we usually want that little bit of overshoot. In the case of fingers, this actually is just like you know going past the knuckle to the end of the finger. So we also we also want that. Um, and let's go add it to our inputs. And we are going to go make a guide for that. All right. Now, here's how we're going to drive things. So the first item in the chain can be driven very, very simply because we're simply going to set its matrix. Now, if we knew that this system would be using recent versions of Maya, we could be sure of that, would be used in recent versions of Maya, we could use offset parent matrix things to be a little cleaner. Unfortunately, we don't know that. And so therefore, we are going to have to decompose the matrix in order to set these attributes. As you can see, I am using 2018 because Contour supports back to 2018, so we kind of need to make sure that it's going to also work with earlier versions of Maya. It's a little unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, and to move the original one around, we're actually going to drive the, the socket. Um, and so that's going to be as simple as, this is going to be very, very simple. Um, let's see, we need a decompose matrix node. We're going to put the base in it because it couldn't possibly figure out which one, right? You know. Um, and then we are going to drive the matrix, well, we are going to drive the attributes of the contour joint socket off this decomposed matrix node, which would be the same thing as setting the matrix. So I kind of wish you could do it directly, but you can't, that's not how it works. This must, by the way, this is very important. What are you doing with your unit conversion? What did it decide to plug that? Thanks, thanks, no, no thanks. It's not supposed to, no, not rotation. This output shear is supposed to go into shear. Oh, is it gonna make me do this programmatically? Cause it just can't be done in the, let's see if it, if I can actually pop up and see shear. No, it will not, it will not. All right, all right. I see, I see where we're at here, Maya. Uh, selected dot output shear. PA dot selected dot shear. Thank you. That is what I wanted it to do. Shear has to go to shear. Don't put it in rotation. I don't know why you're doing that, Maya. There we go. That is what I expected to see. Let me note, by the way, that shear is important. Um the uh uh so the shear is uh it should, Shear is important in part because what you get out of your world matrix here may include things that are part of a hierarchy. You've get, we've grabbed it from the end of a hierarchy, and in order to actually accurately represent that, or you may be putting it on something that's in, inside a hierarchy that might have non-uniform scale. And if you do, shear values will appear. And if you don't represent them, you can get very, very unexpected results. So you pretty much always have to connect shear anytime you're doing, you're actually setting something's matrix, or you're not truly setting its matrix even though a lot of the time it actually won't matter. But it will matter sometimes, and then you'll be sorry that you didn't do it. All right, so what that means is the joint socket now is just moving around with the base. Not Nothing nothing really to see here. This is, this is pretty straightforward, right? Okay, now what do we do with the next one? We need to drive that bone. So that's bone one, and we need to get the necessary information to drive it with. Now to do that, I need to know 
because keeping in mind the interface here is all is all world matrices and it's world matrices because that's the simplest most universal representation of transforms you can have I need to figure out from the world matrix how far away these things are from each other and I'll use a couple more nodes to do that specifically I'm going to use a bolt matrix I'm going to take uh let's see what I need to know is joint one in the space of base. So I am going to put joint one in the matrix in, and I am going to use an invert node because uh, as anyone familiar with matrices and their behaviors will, will tell you, uh, when you are parenting something to uh, one transform to another transform and you want it to maintain its world space transformation, what you do is you, you multiply it by the inverse of the transformation of the parent uh, that you're trying to put that space into. So if we want to know what joint one is relative to base, then, then the way to know that is to multiply it by base's inverse matrix. And now we can decompose this and that, in this case, we actually need to do, um, we actually want to split it out. So in this case, even if we had offset parent matrix available, we would use a decomposed matrix node because we're actually going to put the translation and rotation in different places. In this case, we know that in this particular implementation, X is the direction of bones, right? We have decided that all controls point down X. Therefore, we can grab the translate X Let's, let's make sure, let's see if I actually screwed this up, but I don't think I did. Uh, we can grab the translate X and we can put it into length. Now, here's something very important and useful. So now, as you may note, watch this. As I change the length, it is, it is essentially using the difference between these two locators. Like, does, is it doing anything with rotation yet? but it is using the difference between them to define the length of that bone. Here's where contour makes this really easy because there's a difference between length and stretch. Stretch multiplies length, but it does it at animation time in a sense. So if we want to have an IK handle or just, you know, directly you want to expose this to an animator, you want to control the stretch of this bone, you absolutely can. There's a stretch value for that. Um, that stretch value has no effect on length. There is a difference there. There is a canonical length. There's a bi or a bind pose length or however you want to put it. That is information that the bone knows about. And in this case, we're feeding in the information from our inputs. And it's a different thing because it is a different thing from stretch. It makes it very, very unambiguous. What is the, uh, what is the canonical bind pose length? versus what is the length that you might have at a given frame of an, of, of an animation where you might be stretching this, this bone, you might be doing other stuff to it, who knows, right? Um, and that information and the ability to control that information through connections is really, really, really useful. And then the next thing we're going to plug it into is next bone or next bone, next joint, I'm sorry, next joint orient. We're going to plug the rotation into next joint orient, which it's not going to let me do because yeah there's a reason i write code to do this usually and it's not because i love writing code although i actually kind of do enjoy writing code but it is mostly because it's a huge pain to do this in the node editor all right so now we have a scenario in which rotation uh is is applied as well and the contour joint remains zeroed because in contour bones through length bone axis, which we're just leaving at X axis because we have decided that this system always uses X. Um, and next joint orient simply defines what the next joint in the chain is going to be. Again, in a very transparent way. If you're building a lot of stuff that you do with conventional rigging, what you end up with is a scenario in which you, uh, you end up replicating something like this, right, internally to your rig. But usually it's not very formalized. And so it's very easy to sort of accidentally break it. It's very easy for other people not to understand that that is what you're doing. Um, 
uh, Contour sort of formalizes this arrangement in a useful way. All right, let's uh, turn our rotation off. And now we just basically have to do the same thing for these other joints down the line. Again, this is why under normal circumstances, I will write code that does this, but I want to do it manually here because and I can just duplicate some of this stuff if need be. Um, in fact, I may, I may actually do that. That does seem like it might be a useful way of avoiding having to manually recreate all of this stuff each time. You know, let's see if I can, let's see if I can duplicate special this. I want to duplicate the input. Oh no, that's going to go back and, mm. yeah, never mind. I am going to have to hook them back up manually, but that's fine. All right, so in this case, we are getting, uh, we are plugging joint two into our malt matrix and getting the inverse matrix of joint one, since it's the next one down the chain. Uh, Brad Clark says, just break the input duplicate and set it back. Yeah, you could. Maybe, maybe that's what I should have done, actually. It's just like, I, I feel like that's, that's, uh, I don't know if that's actually all that much easier. I don't know. This is the sort of thing that I usually write code for, and I have a little bit, and maybe I'll just rely on it a little bit in the future. But anyway, um, let me just, uh, let me just set this up. Yes, I want matrix sum. I want it to plug, be plugged into input matrix. Yeah, there was also some discussion of tentacles a little bit higher in there, a little bit of yep. a follow on from that. I will say one thing, I mean, not to toot our own horn too much, but I think I'll go ahead and do it, which is that uh, Contour does make tentacles a little bit easier. It really does. <laughs> it, it makes them very I easy. Mean, in a way, it's kind of funny because in a sense, what Contour is, is something that does tentacles very well. It's just that if you solve the problems a lot of the problems in doing tentacles. It solves a lot of other problems too. It turns out that they're pretty generally applicable problems. Is it gonna let me, no, it isn't, is it? I'm gonna have to do this from the command line again. Yeah, okay, it, but it knew that rotate goes to rotate. Y you never know. Let's just make sure that this actually worked. Oh no, it didn't because I did not plug anything into length. Uh, and in fact, I plugged something into translate, which I absolutely should not have done, because translate is supposed to get published into plugged plugged into length instead. And in fact, you can't translate them, so that wouldn't even have been very useful. All right. So now, similarly, that didn't quite work. What went wrong? We should still have uh, the output rotate plugged into rotate, right? Oh no! What am I doing? My brain is clearly uh, is clearly not working properly here. This is the case where you're using a bone, not using a transform. Uh, you don't actually need to plug any of this stuff in. It's all completely irrelevant. What you do, in fact, have to do is to plug in the uh, plug the rotate into the next joint orient. I was confusing the, this scenario with the one from the joint socket earlier. It's a different thing. All right, here we go. Yes, that is what I wanted to see. Now you can change its length. Now, I'm getting real tired of this and I'm thinking I'm gonna write some code. Eh, no, I don't really have time to do that right now. Or I could or I could try to grab it from the other the other bit that I have already written to do this exact thing. Yeah, let me let me just really quick check that out and see if I've got something essentially lying around that I can use because this is exactly the kind of like doing stuff and redoing it that I don't care for. Oh no, I don't actually have it. I don't actually have it in this branch. All right, I'm just going to do this manually for now. Ah, man, I've been using UE too much. I forget the copy and paste is not what you want to use in Maya. It's duplicate.
This won't really take that much longer. All right, we've got contour bone three. Let's grab the translate out of our decomposed matrix, plug that into length, which it will not even give me on its little dropdown. Plug this into next joint orient. There's only one input, Maya. How come you don't know? All right, and this one's going to be bone four. Well, neither of those. Probably doesn't show up because length isn't keyable, but anyway. All right. Uh, nope, I did something wrong there, clearly. What did I do? Probably messed up which thing is going into which inverse matrix. Right, so which one of these is working properly and which one of them is screwed up? Let's just see what their lengths are. That should, ah, here's one with a negative length. That probably got something in the wrong order. In fact, I'm quite positive that's exactly what happened. Yep. That's more like it. Did I do the same thing here? Let's just see. Hmm. Ah, this one is a length of zero. I clearly, uh, oh yes, I see what happened here. I have multiple things going into, oh wow. Oh, that was very unfortunate. It decided to do something real unfortunate there. Do not know why it even let me put something in uh, output matrix. That does not make a whole lot of sense. All right. This is what happens when you do this manually. Ah. Yeah, I got this backwards again. Pretty sure, right? Um, this one is being plugged into contour bone three. We should therefore be looking at the difference between inverted yeah, I think that's correct we're talking about joint two in joint one space ah perhaps we are not perhaps this one should be joint three in joint two space I think that is actually the right one to affect this bone Let's just make sure that that is actually what we have. And it isn't, and that's why this isn't working. All right. Better. That one's working properly, and now we just got to fix up the last one. Yeah, that's overshoot. Got the wrong input. There we go. Oh, uh, no, we don't quite. One second. Uh, now it's working properly. All right. So what we have here 
is a case in which the bind pose, as it were, of the bones is being defined through these specific attributes that in contour are designed to essentially define what the bind pose is, right? Things like length and next joint orient. That's sort of your, your data that defines the canonical bind state. I mean, it, uh, bind state is perhaps an incorrect word. You don't have to bind in that state, but it is sort of the canonical base state of the ring. Um, the zeroed state, if you want to put it that way. And we're driving all of those attributes rather than setting their values, which is what an auto rigger would do. Meaning that even when we have something where like, let's say you've gone and, you know, I mean, this is a weird looking, weird looking uh, rotate set of rotations for a finger, but you know, you get the idea, like your finger is doing something else. Your ability to define what those relationships are still remains. I can change the length of any of these things or change their base bind rotation even while it is in, in situ, while the rig is actually there and functioning and has already has all its parts. And so that's one of the really, really central ideas of componentized rigging. These things are not, I build a rig and then I set all this data and now it's this forever until I decide to rebuild it. It's this, the, the it, it, in, in order to know what its canonical position is, it always relies on a connection from something else, an input. And in order to enumerate very clearly what those inputs are, I have defined I have defined them exactly on this input node, um, where I'm like, the, this is specifically the inputs that this thing can have. And that is a very sort of programmery way of looking at this, right? You know, when we talk about the fact that we're almost sort of treating the node graph as if it were a programming language, because let's say you have a function with a defined set of arguments. Like this is, this is a pretty analogous scenario. Um, one of the things that makes it, um, and, and ultimately, right, when the component is being used inside an actual rig, essentially its state is defined by two things. One is the inputs that it receives, which gives it its base state, and the other one is the actual controls that the animator can select and key, and that's the other kind of input that can go into this component. Those are the only two kinds of inputs the component can receive. One of the really critical aspects of doing componentized rigging is and you sometimes have to prevent yourself from doing it because Maya doesn't really, well, it, it actually kind of does. I mean, there's these, there's these concepts called, uh, called assets and we can get into another time. I think why I'm not using them that sort of try to make the node graph this way where it's sort of abstractable and you could put stuff in a box with explicit inputs and outputs, but they're not super well supported in Maya and most people don't even know they exist. And, uh, so we're not doing that. We actually have to enforce that ourselves, right? The rule with this kind of rigging is you cannot go and mess around with stuff inside the component. Um, unless you're changing the component itself, of course. You want to update the component with new functionality. That's a different story. But the component can only ever talk to other things or be talked to by other things in very specific defined ways, Me, which is what makes it possible to swap components out. Uh, in this case, in this implementation, by re-referencing them. Um, so let me do a couple of things to sort of fix up this this uh this finger as like a finger we could actually use um such as returning it's everything to zero and uh you know like actually making all of these values also zero because that of course these these are the inputs in a sense that the animator would be providing right you know they're keyframing actual controls and because this is contour we have very little to do in order to make this like an actual usable set of controls. Mainly, we have to go to these jo these joints and we have to uh, add some circle shapes, which you know we can we can later define their radius. Usually, that is actually I suppose another input that I allow, which is you know the uh, whoever's ringing can go in and set these radii. Um, you could make that an explicit input too, I suppose, but that isn't something I really do because it is a little bit. Like if you lose that in some way, it's really not the end of the world. It's just the appearance of the of the node. Um, so there's there's a few areas where it's a it's a little less completely defined than perhaps it it ideally ought to be, but it's still much much more defined in terms of how data flows into and out of the component 
than a normal rig is, which is what gets you all of these advantages. So, all right, in order to make this an actual usable component, one more thing I need to do is these are going to be animated. Um, the user is not going to be messing around with a number of these things because it's a it's a uh, because it's a finger. Uh, they probably will be changing the radius, so I'll be leaving that alone. Um, they might want to animate the twist. They might want to animate the bulge. Uh, we're going to assume that they are not doing override blend because uh, that is normally used for, um, you know, FKIK, and we're not really doing that on the fingers. So I'm going to lock and hide those. I'm going to lock and hide the visibility. Um, no, I meant, to, I meant to hide it too. Um, and then uh, I'm going to make radius non-keyable. You probably do want to be able to manipulate radius. You In this context, you don't necessarily want to be able to key it, though. Um, I, I mean, you might want to key it in some contexts. Maybe I should leave it keyable. I don't know. Um, but in this particular context of being a finger, you probably don't. So I'm going to say that we are going to make it non-keyable. Um, twist and bulge, totally things you might want to animate, leaving those in place. Oh, also scale doesn't really have any particularly useful purpose in this context. You can, of course, translate them to stretch, and that's perfectly fine. And here's one thing that is kind of nice. So if I were building a normal auto rig system, um, let's say I hide the guides, and let's say I don't show joints, right? Which, of course, now, now I'm just sort of seeing them as controls, and you don't really see what's going on there, but they'd actually be bound to a mesh. Um, we have just, in the past, like, you know, kind of half hour, right? I did a bunch of explanation and ranting, and some of it was probably a bit incoherent, but um, I have mostly, and there's one more thing it needs, but I have mostly built an actual component just now. Now, if you were building an auto rig system to define a finger, even though a finger is pretty simple, right? We're, we're doing a very simple thing here. It would almost certainly be a lot more complex than what I just did here. One of the other advantages of componentized rigging is if you stick to the rules, you need ex the explicit inputs, you can't deviate from that, everything's based on the inputs, even though it can sort of be a little obnoxious to deal with all those matrices, again, normally speaking, I actually don't make them all by hand, right? You know, um, the, uh, you are, you know, you, you don't do it all by hand, so something like this becomes very, very simple. We have just authored a component. It took us about half an hour. That's very, very much unlike how auto rigging works, even with something as simple as a finger under most circumstances. Um, now, here's the remaining bit that we haven't done. Uh, well, for one thing, I got to check where I actually put the, the, where do I put the actual bones? I'm pretty sure I put them in the anchor. Yes. So there's this concept of an anchor. So here's what the anchor is for. And this is actually also a pretty useful concept in terms of, not honestly, not just uh, not just components, although it's very, very useful for components, but with rigging in general, right? So we have all of these world space matrices coming in from the, uh, you know, coming in from the guides. Like if I, I can take the guides, I can move them around. They're going to like pull all this stuff around. It's always going to move where the guides go. But the guides themselves are only passing in world space matrices. We can parent the guides to stuff and that's perfectly fine. That's part of the reason why passing in world space matrices is great. And we can, on the other side, on the other side of the inputs, get all of these world space matrices and do whatever math we need to in order to get the data out of them that we need to basically figure out where, you know, what lengths and uh, and orientations we want all of these things to have. We might need a bit of additional data out of them uh, when we get to somewhat more complex stuff, like a foot, which is probably something we're going to do soon, maybe maybe next time. Um, you know, the finger is like super simple, right? That's the simplest case. Um, the, um, however, we are setting those using these, these world space matrices that are coming in. So here's the question. How do you parent the system to something else? This is a finger. It's got to move with the hand. Well, the matrices that it's getting to set these values don't know what the hand is because these inputs, you know, in order to figure out this data, it can only rely on these inputs. It can't know anything else. It's never allowed to know anything else, you know, except for a few other things that we did enumerate, but you know, um, so it can't know where the hand is, uh, or rather it can know where the hand is, but only if it's an input. So here's what we need. We actually need to have an input that is essentially for its parent. And that doesn't have to be a hand. I mean, it could be anything, right? But in order to be able to do what we have just done and use world space matrices to figure out all of these details, um, 
we would have to complicate each each of those systems with an additional multiplication necessary to deal with the fact that this thing is parented to the hand, which just sort of complicates things a bunch, and I kind of don't want to do it. So an anchor is an, or at least I made up that term. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if it's a good term. Is an alternate way to do that. It is the parent for the entire system. Uh, no, it isn't, because I just moved inputs around, which doesn't do anything. Sorry. It, there we go. It is the parent for the entire system. It would be, essentially, the hand, and, uh, you know, if you, if you had it being parented to the hand. However, what we can do with this is use both the matrix and inverse matrix, uh, or rather, actually, a, a better way of putting it, to use the matrix of the hand's actual position as you're animating the character, the hand somewhere in space, and its canonical position, you know, its world space matrix of where its guides go, its input, and you can take the difference between those things and apply it to this anchor. And it works out very nicely in terms of simply taking uh, all of this world space matrix data that we've got, we're, we're getting in from the inputs, and making sure that uh, all of those all of those values can get set to wherever they need to go in world space. But then when the character is actually being animated, they can be moved around appropriately by whatever its actual parent is. Hopefully, I mean, I'm about to show you how to set this up. Actually, I may not do that this this session because it's it's a six ten now, and um, I may want to sort of wrap things up. Like I said, I want to keep things a little briefer than we used to do, um, so maybe that's what we'll start next session with. But the basic idea here is that uh, a lot of stuff that you do with matrices, right? You know, um, and and some of the stuff that I'm saying here, like. Uh, you know, Matthias is not going to be surprised by any of the things I'm saying, right? Like, you know, about using matrices. But I don't know exactly who who is listening to this, and lots of people may be uh, maybe less familiar with with how you use matrices in rigging. Matrices can be confusing at first, right? The way that you stack them up and the behavior that they have, um, can can be a little to, a bit to wrap your head around. However, and sometimes you just get it wrong and then you're just like banging your head against like, oh, why, why, I thought I did this in the right order. Why did it, why is it getting the answer that the wrong answer, right? However, once you do have some understanding of them, they make a lot of stuff that you do in rigging that people often create like redundant systems in rigs or systems that are also, uh, often quite complex and they can actually end up being very, very simple. And the simplicity of working with matrices and vectors over, um, you know, translate, rotate, scale values and a an explicit parenting hierarchy can actually be like a huge, a hugely significant advantage in rigging in terms of just how effectively and how fast you can actually put stuff together. Um, if I had to try to do like this whole thing I did here, which, you know, is actually not that complicated, right? I mean, it's all, it's sort of obnoxious that you need like all these nodes to do it, but you know, it's not really, uh, you know, it's not particularly complicated. I mean, and it's a simple case, but if you were to try to get all of these values, like what would you do if these were all just transforms and you needed to basically do the same transformations? Well, you'd probably need a whole bunch of redundant hierarchy and constraints, which ultimately, constraints, of course, are doing matrix math, would amount to the same set of things. Like, this is ultimately what would be happening. But it would be about 10 times more complicated with, like, 10 times the number of nodes. And this is, this is often how you get rigs with, like, tens or, like, in some, in some really crazy cases, hundreds of thousands of nodes in them. Like, this is how stuff like that happens. And, um... I mean, I mean, and it is, uh, it is not actually necessary, right? I mean, depending on what you're creating, right? Maybe, maybe you have something that is truly irreducibly complex, but an enormous amount of the complexity that we do see with regs, um, is, is, is reducible, right? It's just going around the, the long way to do something that is actually quite simple if you reduce it to its simplest elements. Contour actually helps with that a lot because, as I was saying, like it's got this built-in concept of like, well, here's here's the bind information, here's the actual deformation, and you don't need a lot of redundant information to, for instance, figure out twists because it's going to do that and it's going to do it more or less perfectly, right? So, um, uh, you know, that's already a big advantage. But even if I wasn't using Contour, this system and the way that it works would be vastly simpler than an enormous amount of what people do with rigs and do with rigging. Um, 
It's just that the rigging, the, the culture and practice of rigging has sort of developed in a awkward way, essentially for historical reasons, right? You're, you're, you're essentially in a position where um, people started rigging with, you know, using some transforms and constraints because that, that's what you had, right? And, uh, and, and things just evolved from there. And of course, it's not the only thing that people do. I mean, there's quite advanced rigging technology in many parts of the industry. But your sort of standard best practices approach to rigging that one sees in a very, uh, you know, all over the place, you know, is, is overcomplicated sometimes by an order of magnitude, you know? Um, one of the things that the component dice system does is give you a framework to reduce that complexity and a, a structure to impose on your rigs that often ends up making them much simpler. Although you could, they could be simple. Like you don't need it to make them simpler, but it tends to guide you towards making simpler solutions to things where I find that the more traditional pra approach to making rigs tends to, guide, tends to guide you towards making things more complex. Um, so now I have ranted enough, I think, about the state of rigging technology. I do apologize a little bit. I sort of feel like um, this session was a little scattershot. There was a lot of sort of abstract discussion. There was a lot of sort of circular, like, you know, this is sort of what we're doing, but we have to explain this other thing first. Uh, you know, it could have been a little more well organized. I didn't really have time to do that. Um, but I would love to hear in these last, you know, 10 minutes or so before, before we get off, uh, what you guys think of this. And if there's things that I've said that don't actually make any sense and weren't explained well, um, or, or if you have, I don't know, essentially any question you want to ask, um, uh, TGS, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, Suneg, perhaps? I, I apologize if I completely butchered, um, uh, TG Seneg, I if, if that is actually not how you say your name at all, um, it says just dropping by to say the contour rig tools looks amazing. I uh, thank you. Uh, I I hope that you that you uh, like it, um, which is perhaps a odd way of saying it since you're already saying it looks amazing. Uh, I really appreciate that uh, it is it is actually helping people um, who you know because rigging rigging is a struggle, right? Rigging is painful, and we're trying to make it less painful. So. Uh, Thank you, thank you for uh, for the vote of confidence. Uh, so, but please, you know, feel free to uh, you know throw out throw out any other questions you have, especially uh, anything about how you know essentially questions about clarifications of of what we have just described. Well, we can no, probably, you know, yeah. We'll, yeah, well, yeah, we'll keep an eye on the chat in case there are some. Um. Well, uh, if, um, you know, if nobody has anything to add, uh, we, uh, you know, we'll be back next week. We're going to keep, keep doing it week after week now, um, after our hiatus. Um, we just, we just had, we, we, we were, uh, we were working on something that, you know, hopefully may or may not come to fruition. You will find out if it does. Um, and uh but we're be, we're gonna recommit to doing it week after week now so i will see you all um next week at the same time five o'clock est on tuesday uh at that point we will uh sort of build this this anchor system which will be quite simple actually uh and probably the first thing we'll do is attach it to the hand uh as an example of like here's how you actually use the system in context and then we're going to move on to uh you know building a much more complicated thing uh, like a leg um, you know, fingers are ridiculously simple, which is why I started with the finger. Um, but building a leg, uh, will certainly put this, put this, uh, you know, set of ideas through its paces, uh, in a way that building a finger doesn't really. Um, and I think a lot of stuff that we're ta discussing about uh, how the, the sort of the way that components offer an interface to the rest of the rig and how you pass data around between them will become much more clear once we stick some fingers on the end of a hand. So, um, yeah, like, okay. please uh, like and subscribe, which, which which we have to say, right? We, we're obligated to say that. And um, uh, please, um, 
you know, feel free to tell everyone you know who cares about breaking an animation that they should absolutely come to the Notional Pipe stream to see uh, important information that they might not get elsewhere because, frankly, they're, they're, a lot of it is not just generally around, even though it probably should be. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Raf. That that was actually really that was interesting because this is something that, like I said, I mean, I'm familiar with 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 the general broad ideas sure. of this. The specifics are pretty interesting. So, well, I really think that it'll become like I think it'll be even more interesting to you once we do get to like how you hook up the components to each other because at that point, I think the parallels with a lot of the stuff we, that we do all the time in code will become even more clear. Although they, that some of that stuff may already be clear to you, I don't know, but yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's making sense. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yep. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming by and hopefully we'll see you next week. Yep. See you then.